people who were buying it. They were saying, oh, you're all right, you've got, uh, you've got your duplex, and you've got your holidays, and you've got your family, and you've got your education, and you've got all these wonderful things, and I haven't got anything. Well, I don't know how much you can take of that. Uh, but after a while, the sales just fell. And um, it was largely because it was this anti-consumer. It was like giving somebody something and then them hitting you. And I don't want to exaggerate that, but the guy who started it was a guy called Hutchinson's Persons. And I said, I want to start a street paper in London, and can you help me? And he called me a motherfucker, which was great, but... Uh, uh, he said I was stealing his idea and all that stuff. Uh, and he wanted to charge me $20,000 and all this sort of stuff. We didn't get on very well. And then uh, he uh, disappeared and no one's seen him since. And some money went at the same time, coincidentally. Anyway, the guy who gave me the chance was a guy called Gordon Roddick, who started the body shop with his wife, Anita Roddick. And I met... Gordon Roddick when I was 21 and I was a homeless uh, drinker and drug user. I was a smash and grab artist par excellence, which meant that I knew how to smash an antique shop window very quickly and steal an antique carriage clock and run down the road. In fact, in the end, I just strolled because this was in Scotland and the antique dealers were so tight uh, mean they didn't even have alarms. So uh, I realised I was in the ideal place. That's not a slur on the Irish, I'm a Scottish nation, I have a former wife of mine, I have a Scottish daughter. Anyway, but um, I met this guy, didn't see him for 20 years and he'd become a multi-millionaire. And I always say to people, when you want to bring about change, you need money. So therefore, if you ever meet anybody with a shed load of money, Stick to them. You've got to have your principles. You tell them exactly what they want to hear. If they write crap poetry, it's the best. <laughs> right there with Shakespeare. And you inveigle your way into their affections. Because you need money to make change. I have done too many uh, shoestring operations that have gone nowhere. And life is too short. If Mother Nature wants a tree over there, the Mother Nature will drop a million seeds. And there's not an awful lot of difference between us and Mother Nature. In fact, I would say we're a part of it. And if you actually look at creativity, anything to do with the creative nature of life, you will always find a very high attrition level. Gordon Roddick was in New York, saw the street paper in 1990, came back to London, tried to get his foundation to get a street paper going, eventually came to me in desperation and said, look, I really like this idea. That there's people selling street papers in New York who have come out of the prison system. There are people who have done all sorts of bad things to themselves and had bad things done to them. So the really important thing is that what we want to do is try uh, doing a street paper in the UK. At the time, in 1990, 1991, as Mr. Isherwood will tell you, there were thousands of homeless people in the UK sleeping in doorways. It was about the defenestration of the 80s and the fact that many, many industries were closed down uh, under Thatcher and there were all sorts of major changes and it all led to this maelstrom of social activity and inactivity in the streets of London. Gordon couldn't get the street paper going. He came to me and I said, look, if I start a street paper, It'll have to be a social business. I don't want to start another charity. There's 501 homeless charities in London alone. I want to give the homeless something unique. I want to give them a really, really good product, as good as I can get it, so that when the person who sells it is proud to sell it, and the public are pleased to buy it. So over the last 20 years, nearly 21 years, we have struggled and not always one, because it's very difficult to uh, keep, a, keep the ball in the air. 
we have struggled to produce a paper that enough of the public <coughs> want to read from a squatter all the way through to a city gent. So that's really what I've been trying to do. But the big thing I've been trying to sell, I think we're having a question and answers. Uh, how long do I yep. go, go on? You've got, you've got three quarters of an hour. Yeah, so how long do you want me to talk? As long as you want, we're, we're here to listen. Oh, lovely. We've got a few chances. <laughs> <laughs> and I also sing. <laughs> Do you want to hear it? Yes. Yeah. All right. Is, I do wonderful. I do a one, wonderful Frank Sinatra. Well, I haven't got a. I, I composed this when I was in a boys' prison. Well, no, you know, I was in a young man's prison. Let's be honest. I can mend a rover, overhaul a Dodge, supercharge a Buick, make a Chevrolet budge. Still and all, I'm happy. The reason is, you see, once in a while along the road, there comes a Ford Capri. <laughs> Last Saturday, I did a TEDx, you know, one of those TED uh, things, Oxbridge, Cambridge, one of them. And I lost my voice because I cycled. And I live in Cambridge and I cycled because I was late for this event and I swallowed a mouthful of flies <laughs> and I couldn't talk for about three days and it's coming back so if I sound very croaky please forgive me. <coughs> I'll try not to spit. <coughs> anyway. So what we have done is we believe very very strongly in the idea of giving the homeless a hand up and not a hand out which is exactly what they tried to do in New York. But the problem, as I said, in New York, is they produced a paper that nobody wanted to read. And if you produce something that is really, to some extent, a pity purchase, what you're really doing is fulfilling all of the prejudices that people have about homeless people. The biggest prejudice, which is universal, amongst homeless people and people who are on the streets and begging all that, is that they're useless. So why would you produce a magazine that actually underlined the uselessness of the person selling it because they're selling you something that they don't want? Why would you not struggle to produce a product that everybody wanted to read irrespective of their social status, irrespective of their age or class, irrespective of what religion they held to. Wouldn't it be wonderful to produce something that you snatched out of the hands of the person who was reading it, who was selling it, so that they felt that it was a publication that they were proud to sell and you were pleased to buy. And creating an equality. If you go into a shop and you buy yourself a sandwich, the man who's selling you the sandwich is selling you something that you need. So there's an equality. He's got something you want and you've got something he wants. He wants your money and you want his bloody sandwich. So lo and behold, the equality happens and that's why marketplaces are some of the most equalizing places in the world. So we have struggled over the last 21 years to produce a publication, and if you look at it, uh, sometimes it's better than the others. We've had to reinvent it recently. If you look at it, it's reasonably well designed. It's got ads, it's got some <coughs> comedy around politics, it's got some columns, the best column, of course, is uh, this one by me. Fantas I'm a great writer. <laughs> Fantastic writer. Do you know where I learned to read and write? In a boys' prison. I was nearly 16, and I couldn't read or write. I spent virtually the whole of my life either in orphanages or being homeless. 
shoplifting, housebreaking, stealing cars. I smashed up an Austin Healy Sprite at 102 miles an hour. Now, any one of you have ever done that, I bet you haven't. They should be making movies out of them. But they're not. And what we try and do is present a series of, uh, of articles which are generally of interest. It is the most difficult thing to do, to produce something that works as a consumeristic <coughs> as a consumeristic must have. In the course of the uh, paper we've had uh, I mean the Guardian for instance at one time, the Guardian which is the major liberal paper of the UK they described the big issue as rather bumbling, a bit amateurish. I don't know if you know the word amateur, which comes from the Latin, meaning for love. An amateur does things for the heart. They do it for love. And they suggested that there was a lot of love in it, but there wasn't much professionalism. And then they ended with the statement, but it is the last vestige of honest journalism in Britain. And this was one publication saying it about another. So interestingly for me, when I look back at the life of the big issue, I'm looking at a, a magazine that has taken homeless people, given them the chance of making their own money, standing on their own two feet, getting out of poverty, and challenging many of the problems that go with poverty. When I first started, there were 501 homeless organizations and virtually all of them turned against me. And the reason they turned against me, this is big people like Shelter and Crisis and all the ones who dominate the homeless industry in Britain, sorry, the homeless sector, I don't want to have a gun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the poverty industry, anyway. And they all had a go at me because I hadn't worked for their organizations. And they said, well, you know, you haven't got a degree in ology and bloody sociology and upholstery and gynecology or whatever the ology <laughs> I can't even remember how many ologies you can do with them. So they really tried to tear me down. And I said, but wouldn't it be nice for once? And I've got a very loud voice. And I'm meeting them, hundreds of these people. Wouldn't it be nice for once, I said, if somebody who had been a part of the problem of homelessness should become a part of the solution. <laughs> Wouldn't it be wonderful if you had a prison run by a prisoner? Wouldn't it be wonderful if you had a hospital run by somebody who had been ill? A friend of mine, a doctor, 65 years of age, becomes very ill. Do you know what he said to me when I went to see him? He said, you know what, I wish I was ill earlier because I've got a totally different perspective on the health service. And I, I almost kissed them, uh, apart from the fact that uh, uh, I was very happy to work with him, but he was uh, still an ex-Marxist, Leninist, Angular's Trotskyist like me, and we then had a philosophical argument about the, the, the Arab Spring. Anyway, but anyway, those, those are the kind of things that happen. <coughs> The very idea that we introduce into our organizations and into our social organizations and our social systems, people who themselves have been a part of the problem to become a part of the solution was totally revolutionary. And to this day, I still stand, even though I'm a 66-year-old git who's getting old and, you know, it's just all these, everything's going, anyway. <laughs> In spite of all that, there are many other people who have been given the chance. Why can't our social programs around gangs be run by gang leaders, former gang leaders? I know they try and bring them in and put them there with all these other people. Why can't we have patients running hospitals? Anyway, that's one of the things. But the other problem that we ran into with all these other groups was they said, why would you want to give money to homeless people who are in need? Why do you want to give money to people 
who will take the money and drink it away or put it in their arm. And I said, are you telling me that we should not allow the British homeless to do what the American homeless were doing? But he went, oh, no, 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 no. I said, all right, then, but let's look at it this way. What are the homeless doing at the moment? I said, so they're doing that already? And they said, yes. And we're always in the police courts. We're always having to go and get them out. Because in order to do that, they were robbing old ladies. They were breaking into shops. They were shoplifting. They were breaking into cars. They were selling their bodies as rent boys and rent girls. So really, what I said to them, so therefore what you're saying is you're quite happy that somebody should be able to feed their habit criminally rather than... And what happened was the homeless physically attacked us because they hated the idea that here we were selling them something. Because their big argument a very old argument, was that they'd always been given something for nothing. So here I was, Johnny Bird, coming along, ex-homeless person, ex-scumbag, and giving them the chance of making their own money, but they would have to pay for it. And that's when the revolution, and they started beating us up and, well, tried to. I fortunately had about 50 very big ex-soldiers on my side who I who were going to beat me up, but I gave them more money. Uh, was, you know, a bit like the British Empire, if you want to start an empire, what you do is you go somewhere, find the biggest guys, pay them off, and say, knock those people out. It works all the time. Anyway, so that's what we did. We colonised the... whatever, anyway. So, so, the, so, so therefore, we began the slow process of getting them away from handouts towards work. Every one of you in this room has been given something which is absolutely fantastic. And that is responsibility for yourself. There comes a time when you're eight, you say, Mum, she says, all right, then she puts it there. You become 18 and you say, Mum, and Mum says, I don't know. You become 28 and Mum says, go and work. <laughs> Earn your own money. And you, this person who has not been able to stand up straight, has to stand up straight and grow and become a whole human being that enables you to have a job, stand on your own two feet and then move on and produce the next generation. What do we do to the poor? We rob the poor of the chance of growing up. We rub the power of independent activities. I wrote an article once about a major... What I did was I got 75,000 homeless people, and I didn't even tell the police. I got 75,000 homeless people, and we marched on the Houses of Parliament, and we burnt it down. We then burnt down Number 10 and Whitehall and all the major offices in the centre of London. We burned them all down. And every one of them, every one of them was carrying this large poster and it said, We demand our responsibilities. Of course, then I woke up and realized that I hadn't done that. Uh, but how many people will demand their rights but will not be demanding their responsibilities at the same time? And the only way anybody has ever grown up in this world is by being given the privilege of having your rights mixed in with your responsibilities. So that's what the big issue is about, it's challenging. Our big challenge at the moment, really enormous, is to fight against anti-consumerism. Now, you've got the Occupy, and I know we all love everybody. I've never met anybody who didn't like the Occupiers. I, I was with Richard Branson recently, and he loves the Occupy. Even though if they got their chance, you know, he'd be hanging from a tree somewhere. <laughs> but they all love it. And you know, as Vladimir Ilyich Lenin said, he said, the, the capitalists will sell you the rope by which they hang you. You hang them. There is this idea, everybody loves the Occupy movement. 
What I believe very strongly is that the Occupy movement has to move on and to get to know how capitalism works better. But more than anything, if we want to bring about social change, we've got to do something about consumerism. Because every time we buy a product, we are voting. <clears throat> if we don't like what Apple is doing, if we don't like the gap between the rich and the poor growing, then buy the products of somebody else. Buy the products of some small provider. Collectively, we have this enormous amount of power as consumers. It is much, much more powerful than we've ever been. A couple of years ago, I read in a paper that half a billion people in India had been lifted out of abject poverty. Not by the fact that a load of Western pop stars came along and gave some money. You know, we like our Western pop stars to give loads of money. It all sounds good, doesn't it? Makes lovely little movies for YouTube. How did it happen? It happened because there were some wants somewhere in the developed world that needed to be filled and they went to India and they got the guys and the girls working there and they worked their way out of poverty. The greatest and the most powerful message I now try and sell is the idea of moving towards what you might call consumer socialism or consumer capitalism. Call it what you want. But the real thing is if we want to bring about social change, we individually have enormous collective power that is very, very often not used. Uh, I was at this event and there was a guy from J. Walter Thompson who said to me, don't you think we need to move more towards a world, there was a, I mean the guy's about to retire, J. Walter Thompson, big guy, you know, he's got a few bob. Uh, he wanted to know if I was staying in the Meridian or the, no, the, the Majestic or something. I said, I'm not staying in a poxy or fly up the hill there. Anyway, and what he said was, don't you think we need to move towards a world where we fulfill needs rather than wants? And I said, but, but look, people have needs. How do you meet people's needs? You meet people's needs because there are people with wants who want to fulfill their wants and you make it for them. So you make the computers in China and you bring some form, some form of social justice because you bring some form of the opportunity of increasing the wealth of the local people. We know that Apple has screwed it up a bit. We know that there are people who have died and committed suicide. But when I was working with my ex-wife on China, she was going over there. All she met was people who were living on absolutely nothing. And when I was in China recently, I saw an emerging middle class who are all based on the fact that consumerism has driven social justice and brought about enormous social justice in parts of the world. We're getting it wrong because there's an unbalance. Over the last Christmas in Britain, as I was telling the last group, uh, there's a group called Tesco's, which apparently is the second biggest, uh, uh, second biggest um, uh, supermarket in the world. 55 billion pounds. 55 billion pounds worth of turnover. 5 billion pounds worth of profits. 2 billion pounds going to the one percenters and all the other people. Where is the magic in that? It's in that 55 billion pounds. And we're concentrating how that 2 billion is spent. <laughs> I'm missing a teeth. Now. I don't <laughs> <laughs> One day I shall do a pantomime. 
<laughs> there are all sorts of things we need to look at. But what happened over last Christmas? <clears throat> Five billion pounds of football didn't happen. Five billion pounds worth of business did not happen. No occupation. No, no occupation. Just consumers decided to go somewhere else. They, they went to Sainsbury's. They went to Walmart. They went to wherever. They didn't want to go to Tesco's. And the share prices fell by 18%. What power! What enormous power that you and I have. And we don't know how to use it. Because there's always some moralistic person telling us consumerism is evil. Do you know what I've done with homeless people in the United Kingdom, in Australia, in South Africa, in Malawi, in Argentina, in Brazil, in North America and South America, as our colleague was telling us? I've given them the chance of making their own money, spending it wisely or unwisely, as we all do, and I've given them the chance to participate in democracy. There is no democracy for poverty. Poor people are not living in a democracy. They're living in a space beyond democracy. And if we want to extend democracy, then we have to extend opportunity. My family are London Irish. I've been involved in all the arguments about Catholics and Protestants since I was a child. I would go to Northern Ireland in my youth and I'd be like this. You wouldn't know, you wouldn't beg there anyway. I'm a great beggar, but you'd never beg there because you would be begging, you'd be begging up a Protestant or a Catholic. I said, what are you? I said, well, I'm a Catholic. He said, well, beg. Anyway, so there were all these problems. How did they change them? They changed laws, they did all sorts of stuff. What did they do? They did a dumbass thing. They put money into the economy. The governments invested in new businesses. Cheap loans for the creation of new shops and offices and all that. And suddenly the power of the paramilitaries disappeared. Or was greatly reduced. It may come back because now we have another load of problems. John, something you missed in, in, uh, in what you've given them. Sorry? Something, something that you've also given the homeless is respect. In, um, in the contributor, you'll see that uh, quite a lot of the articles are written by the homeless themselves. And when you buy the paper from them, because people actually, they drive into work, they have, they, they, they have, they, they're used to seeing that person selling that paper, so they, you can choose where you, who you buy it from, basically, just on your normal journey. So, you, you, you know, I, I have a relationship with about three of them, and, but, when they say, give you the paper, they go, I'm on page 14. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And well, that is such, it's such a cool thing. You know, they've written this little, they've written a piece of it. it might be just a, a you know, review of something, but, but there's pride that's coming there. And they're not homeless anymore because they're actually earning money and they're actually, I mean, they started from a homeless position, but they're able to house themselves. And that is an incredible thing. Absolutely incredible. It's just it's a magic idea. Yeah. Cool. But you know that what's so interesting about that is that we we do that in every one of the street papers throughout the world. But now we're doing more. And I'm glad you gave me the chance to segue into the my last final bit. How, what time do we end? You've got about five minutes, John. Oh, jeez. I wanted to start. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to tell some jokes. Anyway, all right. Um, one of the last things we're doing... Oh, the new things we're doing is uh, we've got something called Answers from Big Issue. And uh, what it is, is it's an online magazine, a digital magazine, and we're working with homeless people predominantly, and we're training them up as reporters and correspondents. And we're giving them uh, iPhones or whatever you call them to go out and report on answers. And answers are projects that have helped people get out of poverty, help get, get out of crime, get out of, uh, out of uh, li literacy and all that. And the whole world is full of answers. There are so many answers in the world and we don't know where they are. And often we need to oxygenate and shed a light on these answers. 
So we've got people in Korea, we've got people in, in South America, we've got people in Africa, we've got people in the UK who are helping us put together these answers because the press is obsessed with the idea of what's going wrong. Fear is one of the most popular um, products. People rush to watch the papers, to read the papers and do the news and all that stuff. Because fear sells papers and sells TV programs. The, and, yeah, the, the, weather, and what, the weather, weather Channel in the US is actually one of the scariest programs. <coughs> you know, the Weather Channel. The Weather Channel, because it's always, you need to watch this because you don't know what, the, what shit you're going to be in tomorrow. This thing's <laughs> heading your way, you know. And it's just, it's terrifying. It, it's, it is a fear channel. <laughs> anyway, I think I'd better end there, but... Uh, is it Christopher, is it? I wish it were. No, no, Bob, it's Bob. Bob, Bob. It's Christopher, he's a very famous one. Anyway, thank you for uh, inviting me to speak to you. Um, I've really enjoyed it. I've, we run out of time. I mean, it's a pain in the hell. Uh, <laughs> tell, tell a couple of jokes, John. Can't you all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, all right, I told, I told this, I've only got about three or four jokes. There's my, uh, yeah, right. my brother, no, I've got it. My brother went into one of these safari parks the other day, and he was disgusted, absolutely disgusted. He saw two lions, two male lions having sex together. He was up, he was appalled. <laughs> right out in the public, he just walked away, they had no pride. <laughs> 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 the other one I always tell, the other one I always tell, because I love it, because it takes a bit, and there's a guy who rushes into the shop and he says, Excuse me, where's the camouflage jackets? And the manager says, They're good, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> The last joke, last joke, last joke. Let's, and I, you, I've tried this with everybody, I've tried it about ten times. Since I've, the last joke is the. Uh, it's the one about um, the, uh, the blokes on an aeroplane and the stewardess comes on and says, I'm sorry, the plane's going down, you better start praying. So, I'm, an, I'm an atheist, I've never played. He said, well, do something religious. So the next thing they're finding is going around with a plate. Answersfrombigissue.com we want you participating. We want you sending your answers. We want you. We'll be sending it to you. It's, it's a newsletter. It's a monthly newsletter. It will be using the finest journalists in the world because we're growing them all internally. And Bob's dead right. One of the most wonderful, the most popular part of the big issue is the stuff that's written by homeless people. It's unbelievable. But they don't tell you off. Yeah. Which is so, so things have moved on. Thank you. You're a wonderful bunch of very young people. I used to be young. I am ex young. <laughs> <laughs> Formerly young. Former 18 year old boy, John Bird. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>